Hi everyone and welcome to our little video for today which is going to be all about the other uses of biotechnology. So we're still focused around our spec reference of 6.2.1e but we're going to be honing in on the penicillin production, insulin production and the bioremediation processes today. So let's start off with the whole drug production system. Now one of the first things that we actually need to be able to do is identify key parts on one of these fermenters. So what we can see in the diagram on the left is an actual fermenter that we would actually use in an industrial process. And on the right, we've got our little diagram showing you what's where. So in this big cylinder, what we actually have then is a bar that runs down the center which has got these little side shoots coming off it and at the end there are paddles. Now the whole purpose of those is to stir the mixture. So they're very imaginatively named stirring paddles. Now those stirring paddles are attached onto a motor to obviously spin the whole shaft and therefore mix the contents of that fermenter itself. Then what you can see is that we've got a selection of inlets and outlets going on in our little diagram. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to have air being passed in at the bottom here. Now that means obviously it's going to bubble through the mixture and you can see the little bubbles in there. And then we obviously need an outlet for the gas, otherwise adding gas to something that's a metal canister would only lead to high pressures and explosions. So clearly we need an outlet to avoid that scenario. So inlet and an outlet. We then also have to add our water and again remove the excess. So again inlet and outlet. The next consideration that we have are the conditions that we need to be able to control to actually successfully produce whatever drug we are intending to in this fermenter. Now a lot of these are just factors that hopefully spring to mind when you think of growth of any kind of microorganism. So the first one is temperature. So what we need to do then is consider the temperature carefully. We don't want the temperature to be too low, otherwise we're going to limit the growth of our microbes and therefore that's going to obviously limit the product. But we also can't have too high of a temperature, otherwise we will end up denaturing the enzymes carrying out the process. So one of those little Goldilocks scenarios, the one that's just right, not too high, not too low, just right in the middle there. Next one is oxygen. Now we need to provide oxygen for this to obviously ensure that our microorganisms are undergoing aerobic respiration. We also need to consider the pH. And again, this comes back to our enzymes. Extremes of pH, either too acidic or too alkaline, will lead to denaturing of those enzymes which will bring our process to a rapid halt. We then need to think about the concentration of the product that we are producing because as we know from our enzymes work then there is the potential for end point inhibition. So what we find is that one of the products of this process can actually inhibit an earlier stage and therefore again bring this process to a rapid halt. And finally, we need to make sure that we are providing the right nutrients for these microorganisms. They are going to need a ready supply of carbon, nitrogen, minerals and vitamins in order to obviously produce these products and to actually continue producing more of those microorganisms as well. So when it comes to actually getting this whole thing set up and ready to go, the first thing we're going to do before we put any of our microorganisms anywhere near it is we are going to sterilize the fermenter. We don't want random contaminants in there because otherwise that can really interfere with our drug production. So we use this superheated steam to sterilize the whole thing. Once it's sterile, then we can supply it with the growth medium, which contains all of those necessary nutrients and the starter culture containing whichever microorganism we are utilizing in the process. Now we do need to make sure that we are adhering to sterile conditions at all times. So this is a process we refer to as asepsis, making sure that everything remains sterile throughout the process. Now the reason this is important 
is because if we didn't, there's a high probability that there would be some other microorganism that would contaminate that fermenter. That's a problem because it can spoil the product, first of all. We might well have some kind of microorganism that converts something else and therefore prevents the product being made. We could find this competition with our microorganism we're intending to culture and therefore they're not getting enough nutrients to actually allow them to carry their process efficiently. Because of those things, we can reduce the yield of our product and some may even make toxic chemicals that could kill off our desired microorganism. So contamination is something we need to avoid at all costs. And a lot of questions to do with why we would have to obviously follow um, any kind of aseptic technique, etc., comes back to this idea of contamination. Now, we have two different processes available for producing our drugs. We've got continuous culture and we have batch culture. If we consider continuous culture, first of all, then this is where we are producing our primary metabolites. Now, primary metabolites are being synthesized by our microorganisms during their active growth phase. And at this point, they're just going to secrete these metabolites into the surrounding broth. What we will do during this continuous culture is we're basically going to remove a proportion of the broth from that fermenter. And then from that removed broth, we can then extract our product. Now, that's got another bonus to obviously allow us just to get the product as it's going, in that we're also going to avoid this end product inhibition or populations becoming too large and therefore obviously having negative effects on the remaining population within the fermenter. If we're removing the broth though, we're also going to be adding new broth because we need to replace those nutrients that are being utilized by those microorganisms as they're growing. So this one you'd be able to spot quite easy if it's continuous culture because we're going to have some kind of a little inlet and a little outlet to allow us to add new broth and to remove the products throughout the process. We're not stopping the process, it continues. We're just taking a little bit of broth out and adding new broth. The other option is our batch culture, which is where we're going to be utilizing secondary metabolites. Now the secondary metabolites are the ones produced during the stationary phase of our microbial growth. And this is going to take place when those microbial cells are placed under some kind of a stress. Now, in order to actually put them under these stress conditions, then what we need to do is basically limit the quantity of nutrients there are. And the reason for that is that if we keep giving them loads and loads of nutrients, they're never going to experience that stress. They're never going to enter the stationary phase. They're gonna continue in that exponential growth phase. So instead, what we do is have a limited quantity of nutrients and we allow that limited quantity of nutrients to be amongst the microbes for a specific time. Then we empty the whole thing out and extract the product. You couldn't leave them in there indefinitely because again, there's a limited amount of nutrients. Clearly they're gonna run out completely at some point, at which point everything just dies. So it's very much a case of working out how many nutrients we're going to be utilizing, how long they would need to be in those conditions to produce those secondary metabolites. Then we literally drain the whole thing out, extract our product, and that gives us our batch of our material. We then need to know some specific examples according to your specification. So the first one we need to know a little bit more about is penicillin. Now, penicillin is a secondary metabolite, so we're going to be producing this in batch culture. If you go back to some of your GCSE history, for those of you that did it, I'm sure you've heard of Florian Chain before. Now, these were two scientists who developed a process for mass producing penicillin through the fermentation of our penicillium chrysogenum. Now, what we've actually done since the time of Florian Chain is we've tweaked the process ever so slightly and basically carried out selective breeding on that particular penicillium in order to increase the yield of penicillin we can get from them. So we're not just accepting the first draft, 
we've actually looked at these penicilliums and then we've obviously gone through the process of selective breeding to maximize our yields. So how does it work? We basically run our fermenter for six to eight days. Remember, batch, we run it for a fixed time period. And then we remove the culture and we're going to filter it to remove those cells. We then add some potassium compounds, you don't need to know any more than that, which will precipitate the antibiotic. So that means it's going to obviously come out of solution. And then that antibiotic is mixed with other inert substances so that it can be prepared for administration to patients. You don't need to know vast details about this process. A quick overview as to why this is basically a batch process is absolutely fine. The second one we need to know a bit about is insulin production. If we go back prior to our lovely modern techniques of producing insulin, then the way that we'd get insulin to treat diabetics was from basically taking the pancreas of slaughtered pigs and then extracting it from there. Now, obviously there are going to be some people that have issues with insulin that comes from dead pig pancreases. For example, certain religions would have a bit of an issue with products coming from a pig plus vegetarians, etc. So we've gone away from slaughtered pigs to our biotechnology instead. And these modern methods are better because number one, we don't have to worry about the insulin not being a perfect match because we are literally creating human insulin now. Not using pig insulin, we are using human insulin. So that means it's more effective than the previous insulin was. And it used to be really quite expensive to extract from these pancreases of pigs. We now have a much cheaper process. So what is this modern technique? This is something that should be quite familiar to us from GCSE and from other work in the A-level, because what we're doing is genetic modification. We start off by taking mRNA, messenger RNA, from the beta cells of the islets of Langerhans, which we find in the human pancreas. Hopefully remember islets of Langerhans are all to do with producing insulin. So therefore, what's the mRNA all to do with? Insulin. So once we've got the mRNA strands, what we're going to do is produce some single stranded cDNA using the enzyme reverse transcriptase. So basically what we're doing is we're changing the RNA code into a DNA code. We then add some DNA polymerase, second enzyme that we should be familiar with, and that then changes our single stranded cDNA into double stranded. Before we finish that little section, what we're going to also do is add some unpaired nucleotides at the ends of the DNA to make these things called sticky ends. Now, as the name suggests, these are little ends, they're unpaired, so therefore they can stick to something else. And the something else in this case is the plasmid from E. coli, and E. coli is a bacteria. So what we're actually going to do is we're going to insert this bit of DNA that we've just created into the E. coli plasmid using another enzyme, DNA ligase. Now, ligase is all to do with joining. So those sticky ends are going to then allow it to join to the plasmid. What we then need to do is get the plasmid into our E. coli cells so what we do is we expose them to what we call a heat shock. Now, that just means that we're going to basically force the plasmid through their membranes, really. OK, so what we then end up with is E. coli with a plasmid inside them that contains the human insulin gene. Once we've got those, we'll stick them in a fermenter. They will produce large quantities because bacteria replicate by binary fission, and we will be able to then just keep them going on a continuous culture. So making sure we've got the little inlets to add more broth, etc., And that means we're going to get large quantities of human insulin at a pretty low cost because we don't need any great conditions to grow those E. coli cells. The third technique we need to know on our spec is bioremediation. 
So remember, bio living things, remediation is restoring. So we're basically using microorganisms here to clean polluted sites, whether that be soil or water, we're using the microorganisms to remove the pollution. And the way they do this is they're able to convert some toxic substances into far less harmful substances. And you can see there's three examples I've given you there, oil spills, which we mentioned previously, solvents and pesticides. So we can use microorganisms to help clear these types of pollution from our land or water. One thing that we do need to bear in mind is because we are li using living organisms, then we need to still have suitable conditions for growth. So it can't be a completely arid landscape. Otherwise, our microorganisms are going to dry out. They're not going to function. So we've got to have the right water levels. We've got to have the right temperature, the right pH, nutrients for their growth, oxygen, etc. It's basically something that we need to make sure that they've got the conditions that they can still survive in. You can't use them everywhere. Now, if obviously they're not suitable in the area for treatment, then what we can do is actually use substances to modify them. So what we can do here is add something like molasses, which is just a product that will supply those nutrients that may be lacking to allow the organisms to grow. If we can't do that where the actual pollution is, so we can't actually release those microorganisms in situ where the pollution exists on the land, then we can potentially extract the soil, take it to a treatment plant where we can then control those conditions. So if the temperatures were going to be really terrible for our microorganisms to grow, we may well decide that we're going to remove the soil from the area and then we'll return it once it's had the bioremediation process completed. In terms of the advantages of our bioremediation then, firstly it's using natural systems. We're not introducing other chemicals here. This is completely natural in its process. We can carry this out in situ in a number of cases. So that means that we're not having to do any kind of extractions. We can literally just add our bioremediation organisms to the area and they do their thing. They don't really make many waste products, certainly not harmful ones. Otherwise, why on earth would you do it? There's less labor compared to using humans to do some kind of a cleaning process. And because we're having less humans involved in this whole thing, there's less risk of exposure to whatever these pollutants may be to humans as well. But as always, there are disadvantages of our bioremediation as well. And the key one, not everything can be treated by bioremediation. Obviously, we can't have a microorganism to remove every type of pollution that we have created on this planet. And a good example there is cadmium, which is in certain types of batteries, for example. So we don't have any microorganisms that can remove that cadmium pollution. Therefore, if we've polluted an area with cadmium, we don't have an option in terms of biotechnology. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you can see when we get another video uploaded. And of course, head on over to the website where you can find some additional resources to help you with your A-level biology studies.